Hey, is that folk music that you play there? What is that? How do you call that folk music? <laughs> I think it was Studs Terkel who asked Big Bill Brunzi, did he consider his blues music to be folk music? And Big Bill says, well, I never heard no horse <laughs> And the shot rang up. Bang! Hot dog! Hot dog! Don't hesitate! It could be your ticket to a new tomorrow! <laughs> Well, howdy, folks, and welcome to Horses Sing None of It. My name is Ralph Litwin, and I'm the host, and we're here today with storyteller Gerald Fierst. How you doing, Gerald? Hey, how you doing, Ralph? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, glad to have you on. Now, you're uh, a teacher, a storyteller, and you're involved with several different organizations of storytellers. That's right, yeah. Here in New Jersey, we have the New Jersey Storytelling Guild, which I started about four years ago, five years ago, out of a group of people who had taken a workshop with me. Uh -huh. And um, and that meets regularly, um, once a month, on the first Sunday of the month in Upper Montclair. Mm -hmm. um, and then in New York, we have the New York Storytelling Center, where I'm a member of the board, and then I'm artistic director of the Jewish Storytelling Center, <laughs> which is at the 92nd Street Y in uh, New York City. Uh, so. Yeah, I'm pretty active. And then we have the Mid-Atlantic Storytellers. <laughs> and the Mid-Atlantic Storytellers have a uh, big conference, a whole weekend down near Gettysburg at Penn Alto, the University of Pennsylvania State Campus in uh -huh. Penn Alto. And how about the national and international leagues of storytellers? Well, the international leagues, I'm a card-carrying member <laughs> of, of the international. Uh, but I'm, I'm not um, a member of their board. I see. OK. <laughs> And uh, you, uh, are, you're a full-time storyteller? Yeah, I'm a full-time storyteller. Every day I get up and go to work and <laughs> tell stories. As people, as a matter of like fact, it was neat job. because when my son was a little boy, my son's in college now, but when he was a little boy, one of his friends one day turned to him and said, I wish my daddy was able to do what your daddy does. And so he said, well, what, what, what do I do? And he said, nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> I said, no, that's not right. I tell stories. And he looked at me and he went, yeah, right. I mean, but it's not true. It's very hard to tell stories. I mean, it's hard to tell stories if you're going to be a professional artist, as, yes. as any professional artist it's knows. It's difficult. Because you have two parts. You have to be a businessman and an artist. Yes, the businessman part is the hard part. <laughs> that's right, exactly, exactly. Yes. Your story reminded me of, uh, I was, made composer of the month at my daughter's elementary school uh, this past month and uh, one of the kids in her class said is he dead oh because <laughs> all the other composers had been well, now they have these bumper stickers that i've been seeing around like my my child was uh scholar of the month or my child was um something of the month and then the name of the uh -huh. school yeah so maybe you should get a bumper sticker Dead you know? composer of the month. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I've, um, um, I've usually found most people are really surprised when they, they hear that somebody spends their profession telling stories. They either say, oh, that's a real old art, dead art, dead composer. You know, and then you have to say, no, there's a big revival. Mm -hmm. and, and there are people all across this country getting together to tell stories in living rooms and in churches and big festivals all around the country. Um, and then you have to also like just sort of start to explain to them that, you know, they, they hear Garrison Keillor or Spalding Gray and they don't realize that those are really just great storytellers yeah. and how storytelling is really something that's not just for kids but for, for adults yes. and how sophisticated it is. And yeah. then they start to say, oh. Now, I understand that storytelling has only recently become something that is targeted towards children. 
I mean, recently in the history of storytelling, it used to be in the tradition, kids just kind of you know hung around the edges right. while the adults well, were telling stories. Sure, in in most traditional societies, the way children learned was by listening, mm -hmm. and so they would, as you say, hang around the edge, and the stories were told, and people learned from the stories what was appropriate, how to get along in a community, uh, the values of their community, mm -hmm. um, and also it was a kind of, um, I guess you could call it a psychoanalysis. You know, <laughs> it, it helped people go through the stages of their lives by giving them the metaphors that they needed to understand what they were going through. You know, the great yeah. hero's journey. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, and it's fascinating because you still see, I work a lot in the uh, Southwest, and uh, when I've been out there, I've worked with um, one wonderful woman, an elder of the San Juan Pueblo uh, named Blue Water, and she'll tell us stories about when she was a little girl. And just this past year, we were up in Taos, and there had been some confusion with our room, and we were six storytellers, including this 84-year-old Indian woman, uh -huh. Blue Water, and we had no room in the inn, right? And there was just one room for all of us. And, you know, we were sort of like, well, I guess we could camp out, but here's this modest woman, 84 years old, how is she going to feel about it? And she looked at us and she said, nonsense, I grew up that way. There's no <laughs> problem living together. And so we all camped out in this room, you know, we all mm -hmm. spread out our sleeping bags or had shared beds or whatever was appropriate. And as we were going to sleep that night, we turned off the lights and we started to say, Good night, Jerry. Good night, Elaine. <laughs> Good night, Maggie. Good night, Marjorie. Good night, Blue Water. And then in the darkness, Blue Water said, Now, isn't this better than sleeping alone? <laughs> so you see, stories really are sort of the essence of what holds people together. Yeah, that's great. Now, I understand that you have a, a story from a place that's very close to my heart, which is Zuni, New Mexico. Uh, yes. And because uh, I have a close friend who's from there. Uh huh. Yeah, I've been out to Zuni several times in the last few years working at the Ashwi School. Um, and I have a story that is probably the all time favorite of the third grade at Ashwi. <laughs> uh, and it just so happens that it comes from their culture, from the Pueblo culture, because it's a coyote story. Mm -hmm. You know, coyote, the little dog who lives in the desert. But it turns out that this story is as good. Anywhere I tell it, because everybody understands Coyote. Because Coyote always gets into trouble because he brags, <laughs> and because he shows off, and because he always chases pretty girls. Uh-oh. So let me tell you this talk, <laughs> right. okay? Yes. You see, it goes like this. One day, Coyote, he was going across the desert when he saw a medicine man practicing a trick. The medicine man was making his eyeballs fly through the sky and land on a tree. Eyeballs, go fly through the tree! Eyeballs, come back to me! Ooh, said Coyote. Now that is a good trick. If I could learn that trick, then I could impress all the pretty girls. Ooh. <laughs> oh, Mr. Medicine Man, won't you teach it to me, please? Stop your howling, coyote. It's an easy trick to do. All you've got to do is say the magic words. Say, hey, birds, go fly to the tree. Hey, birds, come back to me. Ooh, coyote, he was so excited, so full of himself to learn this trick, he had to do it right away. He did it two times. Hey, birds, go fly to the tree. Hey, birds, come back to me. Hey, birds, go fly to the tree. Hey, birds, come back to me. And then he took off across the desert, and he ran away so fast, so fast, that he forgot to listen to Medicine Man as Medicine Man called after him. But Coyote, don't forget, only do the trick three times a day, or your eyeballs won't obey. Well, when Coyote, <laughs> he got to the village, and he was so puffed up. He was so excited about what he could do, he just couldn't wait. He just had to try it out one more time. Abels, go fly to the tree! Abels, come back to me! And then into the village he strutted, and he went to all the beautiful girls. 
Come and see. Come and see what Coyote can do. Come and see what Coyote has to show to you. And all the girls, they gathered around. And then Coyote, he got ready to do the trick. And suddenly he thought, oh, but how many times have I done it today? And how many times did the medicine man say? <sighs> that medicine man, he's an old man. You know what happens when they get old. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. No, I don't have to listen to him. And anyway, the first two times, they were practiced. They don't count. Coyote can do whatever Coyote wants to do. And so he said the magic words. Hey, birds, go fly to the tree. Hey, birds, come back to me. Hey, birds. Hey, birds. Eyeballs! Where are you, eyeballs? But those eyeballs, they didn't obey. They just stayed there dangling on a branch until a big crow came along and had them for lunch. And then all the girls, they picked up stones, they threw them at Coyote, they chased him out of town, and he landed in the middle of a dusty old field. A woo! I'm blind! I'm blind! And along came Mouse. What's the matter, Brother Coyote? Oh, can't you see, Mouse? I've lost my eyeballs. Oh, what I wouldn't give for even a teeny tiny mouse eye like you've got. Won't you give me one of yours, please? Stop your howling, said Mouse. Here. And he took his little mouse eye and gave it to Coyote. Now, it was much too small for Coyote's head. Coyote, he popped it into the eye socket, and it rolled this way and that way and up and down. But it was better than nothing. And with that teeny tiny eye, why then, Coyote was able to start his way back home. But who should he bump into on the road but Buffalo? Hey, hey, which way you're going, said Buffalo. Oh, said Coyote, forgive me, Brother Buffalo, but I've only this teeny tiny mouse eye with which to see what I wouldn't give for a giant buffalo eye. Won't you give me one of yours, please? Oh, stop your whining here. And Buffalo gave Coyote a giant buffalo eye. Oh, it was much too big. Coyote had to push and shove to get it into his eye socket, and when it finally popped in, why then it still stuck way out. But it was better than nothing. And so... Coyote made his way back home to where Mrs. Coyote was waiting. Oh, Coyote, she said. What kind of mischief have you been in today? What is this I see? And Coyote, he hung his head way down. He tried to slink away. And that is why, even to this day, Coyote never looks you straight in the eye. All right. <laughs> so that's a, that's a great old story from, from the Pueblo traditions. But actually, a lot of the storytelling I do, not, not so much in the schools, but uh, oftentimes around the country, um, comes from my own Jewish tradition because um, I'm well known as a Jewish storyteller in the Jewish Storytelling Center in New York City. Um, and it's amazing. And of course, Jewish stories have been both taken from and given over to all the world because the Jews have moved all across the world. But here's a wonderful old story that's sort of the essence of stories that has some roots back in the Talmud. There's actually little references to this kind of story and probably dates maybe three, three and a half thousand years ago. You see, there was an old man named Elisha. And this old man, he planted trees and the hills about his house were filled with orchards. Now one day, old Elisha was on his hands and knees, digging a hole to plant a tree, when the king came riding by. You there, said the king. Old man, what are you doing? Why, your majesty, said Elisha, I'm planting trees. The king began to laugh. But you're so old, and it will take so long for that tree to grow and bear. Do you really think you'll ever taste the sweetness of the fruit that grows on there? Oh, your majesty, said old Elisha, if God is good, I will have the years. But if not, my children will taste the sweetness of these fruit. And the king was pleased with this answer. And so he said to Elisha, may God give you years. And when that tree flowers and bears fruit, pick the first crop and bring it to me, and I will give you a rich reward. And then the king drove on. Now God was good. And Elisha lived to be a very, very old man. And finally that tree flowered and bore fruit. 
And remembering the words of the king, Elisha picked the fruit and filled a basket full and took it to the royal court. And bowing low before the throne, he said, Your Majesty, remember me, Elisha, who always plants trees. I have come as you commanded. Now give me the reward which I deserve. And immediately the king took parchment and pen, wrote out a royal command, and sent Elisha to the armory. And when the guards read what the king had writ, why, they took that basket from him, emptied it out, and filled it full of gold. And then they escorted Elisha home. And with two pieces of gold, he bought food and drink for everyone, and everyone celebrated his good fortune, except for one young neighbor. And this young man, he looked at Elisha and thought, now why should the king give so much gold to one so old? The king should have given me the treasure, for I am young, and I would know how to spend it. And so that young man, he went to his own orchards. He picked the fruit from the trees and filled a basket full and went to the royal court and bowed low before the throne and said, Your Majesty, I am Elisha's neighbor, and I have seen the gold that you gave to him. But he's so old. And when he picks the fruit, his hands tremble and he bruises the skin. Now I have taken perfect care to pick only the unblemished fruit to bring here. Give me the reward, which I deserve. And so the king, he took parchment to pen, wrote out a royal command, and sent that young man to the armory. And when the guards read what the king had writ, why, immediately they fell upon him and took him prisoner and led him out in front of the palace and put him in the stocks and locked his feet, his hands, his head. And underneath his chin, they put the basket of fruit. And about his neck, they hung a sign written in the king's own hand, which read, throw these fruit at me. And so all day long, the people came and whap, threw the fruit and struck that young man, and the Jews stripped down, and the flies came and bit, and the sun beat upon his head. And finally, when the day was done, why, they released the young man and chased him home. And he went stumbling down the road until he got to his own village. And there, who should he see but old Elisha planting trees? Look, look, said the young man, look what happened to me. And then he told the whole story. What do you think of that? And old Elisha looked up at him and shook his head and said, I think. You're lucky we're not bricklayers. <laughs> <laughs> and then Alicia went back to planting trees for the next generation. All right. Right now we're going to take a little break for a public service announcement, and we'll be back with Horses Sing None of It in one minute. You can win this swell set of recordings by artists who have appeared on Horses Sing None of It simply by sending your name, address, and telephone number to me, Ralph Litwin. Horses Sing None of It, 140 Morris Street in Morristown, New Jersey, 07960. You can win recording by the amazing, incredible Liza D. Savino, Dennis Dougherty, Margo Hennebach, Juggernaut String Band, Dave Kleiner, Ansel Matthews, Kathy Moser, Patrick Regan, Elaine Silver, New Jersey Songwriter Circle, and these two albums by me, Ralph Litwin. To win, send your name, address, and telephone number to Ralph Litwin, Horses Sing None of It, 140 Morris Street, Morristown, New Jersey, 07960. Aha! We're back with Horses Sing None of It. Gerald Fierst is our guest today, and he's just been telling a story from the Jewish tradition. So I thought it only appropriate that I sing a song about my grandfather, Grandpa Emil, the fighting Jew of Morristown. <laughs> Grandpa Emil trained his dogs to go coon hunting. He had a little room just for canary birds. Taught him songs to sing with his special whistle. He had a hand me down parrot, but all it would say was, Shut the door, Goldberg. Now, one summer day, he took the family driving. When the car overheated, didn't get him down. He just pulled down his zipper. And he peed in the radiator. It was just enough to get him back to town. 
Yeah, Grandpa was full of piss and vinegar. And though during my life he wasn't physically around, whenever I think of him, emotions begin to stir. For Grandpa Emil, the fighting Jew of Morristown. He was proud of his dad, who wrote commentaries on the Torah. He was the brightest scholar in that Russian town. Published in four volumes, and as tradition dictated, he married the daughter of the richest man around. My mother's cousin Sidney, at the wedding of his son, he had a couple too many and it loosened up his tongue. When I was a kid, your grandpa took me coon hunting, no, oh, my ma didn't like it. Out in the woods at night till way past one. And did you ever hear the story how he walked into a bar? A big man said, when are you gonna buy me a drink, you cheap Jew? Your grandpa said, what did you call me? When the man repeated it with a single punch onto the floor, that big man flew. Cause grandpa was full of piss and vinegar. And though during my life he wasn't physically around, whenever I think of him, emotions begin to stir. Grandpa Emil, the fighting Jew of Morristown. cabinet shop. It's in his old horse stall. Three bays cement block with a wood frame roof. One day Tolly, a backyard neighbor, came over to share some tales about Grandpa and his friends of feather, fur, and hoof. Right there was the dog pen. There one for raccoons, there for pigeons that tumbled in the air. They'd fly up high, then fold their wings and tumble towards the ground, and swoop on out of it, close as they dare. All us kids in the neighborhood, we loved him. He'd pay us to work in the garden over there. And the horses that he had were Blackie and Sierra Sue, and Martinet was the chestnut mare. This next story I've heard from several different people. To be buried face down would be his wish with his dying gasp. Why is that, they asked him. Well, it ain't no mystery. It's so my creditors can all kiss my ass. And if he's looking down, I hope he's proud. Grandpa took no guff, and neither do I. And though I doubt you'll find me, Engaged in fisty cuffs, I feel close to Grandpa Emil, and I tell you why. Cause Grandpa was full of piss and vinegar. And though during my life he wasn't physically around, whenever I think of him, emotions begin to stir for Grandpa Emil. 
the fighting Jew of Morristown. That was great. Thank you, Jerry. That's wonderful. We're back with you, and uh, gee, we've got just two minutes left here, so I think we're down to our wow. our closing thing. Well, it would be nice to teach a story for people to tell to other people, because that's how stories travel around the world. Um, I know a nice sign language story. Great. Um, we should show your name and telephone number so people can get in touch with you. Okay. And uh, in case they want to get a storyteller for their school or for their program anywhere. That'd be great. Birthday parties. Want bar mitzvahs. Churches. <laughs> weddings. <laughs> anything at all. Retreats, conferences. Yeah, a story is always a good place, good thing to have any place. Great. Right. I'd like to thank you for coming on. The time just oh, flew by. And my pleasure. Wonderful. My and we pleasure. hope you all tune in to Horses Sing None of It next week. And uh, we're going to take it out with a little music and a little sign language okay. story. Okay. Well, let me explain that in American Sign Language, the language of the deaf, make a V and put your thumb in it as a K and put that across your chest and it means king. Or if you curl your fingers, make a C and put it like that, it's a Q. So that would be queen, queen. So this little story goes like this. It goes, I am the king the king of me. I can become whatever I want to be. The sun and me are two of a kind. With our hearts, our imaginations, and our pride, together we shine, we shine, we shine. Right. It is against the rules to play in the car with my friends. And I knew it. I flattened Dad's new chicken coop. It was me. I did it. I will never forget what Dad said that day. When you knew you were in big trouble, you still told the truth. And we are so proud of you. The important lessons in life are learned at home from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs>